Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I'm uh, Anthony Smith, Vice Provost uh, Education here at UCL, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you all to this um, our, our second uh, Global Citizenship uh, Lecture of, of 2013. And um, the, the, the purpose of these lectures is to, to, to bring in uh, distinguished speakers to um, really come in to, to uh, work with us and to, to challenge with, uh, with us about what it means, what, what global citizenship means, and particularly, I think, what, uh, what we mean by uh, being London's global university. And um, I'll shortly um, be, uh, be introducing the, uh, this evening's uh, speaker, His Excellency uh, Sheikh Mohammed bin Abdullah Al Thani. Before I do that, um, I'd like to uh, welcome back to uh, UCL a recent retiree uh, who will be known to most of you, I'm sure, Professor Michael Wharton, uh, who retired at, just at the end of September. And um, Michael's just going to start off with a, a few words about the uh, 2013 Year of Culture. Michael. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, you may not all know that this year of 2013 is the UK Qatar Year of Culture or the Qatar UK Year of Culture, depending which country you're in at the time. Um, but it's very important for us actually to recognize that while this is a UCL lecture in terms of global, global citizenship, in terms of understanding how achievement can be encouraged. I think it, it's also important for us to talk about why we are a crucial partner in the, the Year of Culture. The Year of Culture is run um, essentially by Qatar Museums Authority, um, whose chairperson, Her Excellency Sheikha Mayasa, is also the chairperson of Reach Out to Asia, of which Sheikh Mohammed is a brand ambassador. So if you like, everything is tied together. And the other key partner is the British Council. But we at UCL are very pleased that we have put on more events than any other um, organization so far. OK. The thing about Qatar is that when you speak to your average man or woman in the street, they think of, in the UK, they think of the owner of Harrods, or the owner of the Shard, or the owner of Paris Saint-Germain, or the owner of the Olympic Village, of the Chelsea Barracks, and so on. Um, and of course, there's been an enormous amount of talk recently about the... Okay, right. You're not hearing. Okay. One of the things about Qatar is that what is it's known for is largely its investment overseas, led by the father Emir Sheikh Hamad bin Khalifa and by the current Emir Sheikh Tamim and the former Prime Minister. And so as you go around UCL through Harrods, um, going to the Olympic Village and so on, realizing this is all Qatari and that um, all of the football teams are being bought up by Qatari, that gives a particular picture of Qatar, which is only one very, very small part of it. UCL has been engaged with Qatar for eight years now, and we opened our campus in 2010. We're now on our second cohort of students. And we're there because of the values of Qatar Foundation and of Qatar Museums Authority, who are our two key partners there and our key funders. And behind all of the year of culture, there is not only the desire to get two countries to get to know each other better, to understand each other from inside rather than simply from outside, but it's also about trying to understand how the entire way that we live is determined by culture and that we have a lot to learn from different cultural organizations. So the kind of things that we've been doing in the Year of Culture, including this evening's lecture from His Excellency Sheikh Mohammed, is things like an exhibition in the Museum of Islamic Arts, one of the world's great museums of art, of where our students were helping the people of Qatar to understand objects from their own culture. By exchanging four of our students from the Slade School of Fine Art here in London with four emerging artists in Doha and working together, in fact, next month um, in a four-week a four residency an international workshop of museum champions from across the world, but with a particular focus on the Gulf region and the, the Middle, um, Middle East area, and a big oral history project where we want to be talking to all of the 
33 categories over the age of 100 to get them to talk about the way it's changed. And for any of you who've been to Qatar occasionally rather than living there, it is a city, a country which changes enormously rapidly. And so it's important for us to try and capture all of the, the history of this country which has become increasingly an important geopolitical power. It provides 85% of Britain's liquefied natural gas. It's one of our most important allies in the, the Arab world. So Qatar is much more than simply Harrods. It's much more than its um, ownership of Paris Saint-Germain. It's a country which is enormously committed to its own culture and to its own traditions, but which is also seeking to modernize and liberalize. And that's an incredibly interesting um, tightrope exercise that the rulers of Qatar and indeed of other countries in the GCC um, are actually having to walk. And for the UK, which is, I would argue, the most diverse country in the world, and London certainly it is, we have an awful lot to learn from what Qatar is doing in how we can actually understand each other and how we can actually make sure that cultural difference becomes a very important part of who and what we are. And at the very heart of all of these changes is going to be the need for, for leaders, for gurus, for inspirers. Um, and that's why we're particularly, particularly pleased that we've got Sheikh Mohammed here today. Um, no pressure, um, but you're going to inspire us, aren't you? So it, we're, we're delighted that this is going to be part of the, the UK Year of Culture. Do try and see what else you can see in, in London. There's a wonderful um, exhibition at the Victoria and Albert Museum, um, which started a few years ago in the um, Museum of Islamic Art in Doha, um, the, the Pearls exhibition. It is quite phenomenal. It has everything from the science of pearls through to Coco Chanel's pearls um, and the most wonderful um, bed of pearls, which is a vast carpet made purely of, of pearls. So it's wonderful to, to go and see a wonderful exhibition at the, um, in Leighton House in um, Holland Park, which will open next month of Afghan art. So there's a whole lot of Qatar UK Year of Culture which is trying to help us in London and in the UK to understand better Qatar and the Arab world. Thank you. Michael, thank you. I knew it was a mistake um, inviting you to say a few words because you've stolen all of mine. Um, however, to, uh, to introduce um, His Excellency Sheikh Mohammed um, and, and his, his lecture this evening, um, Sheikh Mohammed is the uh, first category to uh, reach the summit of Everest, and that's clearly what uh, he's going to be talking to us about tonight, sharing that, uh, that experience with us. And, um, the, 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 I guess one of the reasons for doing that was in his, in his role as one of the brand uh, ambassadors for the, the Reach Out to Asia program. And uh, the objective which, uh, which he achieved um, from, uh, from the, 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 the ascent of Everest was to, uh, to raise a uh, million dollars to, to support projects in uh, Nepal. So, uh, Sheikh Mohammed, thank you very much for. Uh, uh, agreeing to speak to us tonight, and um, we very much look forward to your lecture, Follow Your Dreams, the story of an Arab with altitude. the sun and sand, 40 degrees temperatures. Yet, I find myself 8,000 meters above sea level. It's pitch dark. I can barely take my next step. 
I can't breathe. Frostbites and losing my limbs? Least of my worries. There's a good chance I might not make it back home. Apart from trying to remain alive, there's one single question that was repeating in my head. Is it worth it? Back at university, I did OK. I didn't get straight A's. I didn't fail either. You can say I just managed to graduate. The day I graduated felt like a dream come true. Felt amazing. In fact, it was awesome. I don't have to read big, thick books again, prepare for last minute assignments, staying up all night studying for exams, attend boring lectures. <laughs> but that amazing feeling was very soon replaced with an overwhelming question. Man, that feeling was horrible. Every year, tens of thousands of students graduate from all over the world. They all share that exact same feeling. That thing did not change for the last 50 years. It is the pain and frustration of now what? It is the pain and frustration of asking yourself, what's next? It is the pain and frustration of not knowing where you're heading in life. Guys, if you take nothing out of today, please take what I'm about to share with you as my gift to you. I wish someone had asked me these questions when I was sitting in your shoes today. You've all been, uh, you've all been handed paper and pen. Does anyone not have a page? OK, can I make sure? Can I all play a page up? You don't have one? OK. Anyone else? OK, on the first column, on the first column, I'd like to try the number one. OK, and answer this question. Where would you like to see yourself one year from now? Think about it and write it down. Take a minute. Even if you're retired. <laughs> Whatever it is. Do you have a piece of paper or? Yeah? OK. 12 months from now. Where would you like to be? There's no right or wrong answer. On the second column, I would like to try the number five and answer this question. Where would you like to see yourself five years from now? <laughs> Suddenly a very simple question becomes difficult, right? It's OK, whatever you think. Take another minute. You want to buy a car, want to buy a house, get married, divorced. <laughs> <laughs> Start your own company, make your first million, climb Everest maybe. Whatever it is, five years from now, where would you like to be? Now, by doing so, you're already way ahead of all those people who have no idea where they're heading in life. They're basically lost. Are you ready for this? Nice. 
Now, 20 years from now, where would you like to be? Could be, could be. Why not? From the looks of some of your faces here, you're saying that I have no idea what I'm going to do tomorrow and Mo is standing on stage asking me what I'm doing 20 years from now. <laughs> it's okay, it's exactly how I felt when I was first asked these questions. But you know what? Take your time. Maybe later this evening, this weekend, next week. As much time as you need. As long as you answer the question of what do you, what would you like, where would you like to be in one, five, and twenty years from now? And by answering these questions, this will give you clarity and direction that will ensure that you will never, ever be stuck in the pain and frustration of asking, now what? Knowing what you want to do is the first thing. So my goal is to stand on top of Everest. And like any goal, do I get it served on a silver platter? Of course not. It's required preparation. On your mark, get set, go! Drive, 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 all the way, all the way, yalla, 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 yalla. Go, 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 go on, drive, drive, drive. Understand this? I'm from Qatar. It's a desert. My goal was to stand on top of Everest. Sand, snow, sea level, highest point on Earth. Hot, freezing cold. Preparation was key. I had to prepare myself for Everest. Guess what happens to those who go to Everest unprepared? Dead. This does not only happen on the mountain. What happens to those of you who go to an exam and prepare? Yeah, you would be dead. What happens to those lawyers who go to court unprepared? What happens to those who go to Dragon's Den unprepared? Shredded to pieces. Dead, right? So whatever you choose in life, you have to prepare from now. So you have to ask, answer this question. Wherever you want, what do you want in five years? You have to start from now. What do I mean by that? Having a big goal is scary. You have to work backwards. You have to break it down into smaller goals in front of you in order to reach your main goal. Everest is not an overnight gig, nor it could be climbed in one step. So whatever you choose in life, you have to start from now. As I said, I come from the desert. I had no idea how to deal with the cold. I had no idea how to deal with the altitude. And I had really no idea what would happen if I fell in a crevasse. So preparation was key. I had to prepare myself. I had to put in thousands and thousands of hours into hard work. I wasn't born a mountaineer. Before climbing Everest, I had to climb many other mountains before that just to prepare myself physically and mentally to be able to challenge that mountain. Mo Farah won the Olympics last year, right? Did he just show up? Look at him. He can't believe that he was crossing that finish line. But how did he get there? He had to work hard to reach there. He had to plan for it. Just like in life, you cannot show up for your dream unprepared. You have to prepare. The biggest sacrifice you will make is time. Time away from your family, time away from your loved ones, or you could have spent it hanging out with friends. People often 
don't realize the amount of time needed behind the scenes in order for you to reach your dream. Everest took me two months to climb, five years to prepare. Whatever you choose in life, you have to start today in order to reap the fruits tomorrow. You have to put in the hours today to be standing on top of your Everest. So whatever you choose in one, five, or 20 years, you must start your preparation, your hard work, and sacrifice from now. So, you all have know exactly what you want. You're preparing for it, you're working hard for it, you're making sacrifices. You're on your way to reach your goal. You're on Everest, heading to the summit. Guess what's gonna happen next? Go ahead, lift it up. Do whatever you gotta do. Go backwards if you have to. Physically, mentally, emotionally, you will face challenges. Can I do it? Am I worth it? Why am I here? Seriously? This was in my head every day on the mountain. That is the sound of self-doubt. Your biggest challenge will come, I repeat, will come from you. I want to tell you that it will happen. And I want to tell you that you will have to fight through it. You might think you're not gifted. You might think you're not smart enough. You might think you're not fit enough. You can never be fit enough to climb the highest mountain. I was on the mountain, I doubted. I got sick, I doubted. I hurt my ribs, I doubted. I got diarrhea, I still doubted. <laughs> whatever it is, whatever challenge you face, you will face doubts and you will have to believe in yourself. Whenever I doubted myself on Everest, I always replaced that thought by picturing myself standing on top of the summit raising my country's flag and suddenly all my doubts just disappeared. So whenever you face doubts, all you have to do is replace that negative thought with picturing yourself achieving your target and you will find, your, you will find all your doubts just disappear. You will have to believe in yourself and you will have to believe that you can make it through. You can't. You won't. Who do you think you are? Are you mad? Oh no, you're definitely mad. People will laugh at you, criticize you, and put you down, and not believe in you. You cannot stop people from 
saying what they want to say. And most of the time, those are the people closest to you. Your father, sorry. Your father, your mother, your brother, your sister, your best friends. Sometimes all of them won't believe in you. But it is you and only you who can make things happen. I'm not sure about all of you guys here, but when someone tells me I can't, I just get that feeling inside of me of wanting to prove them wrong. For example, when you first saw Susan Boyle on TV, what did we all do? We laughed, right? We all laughed. But who, who's laughing now? Cut from the high school basketball team. He went back home, locked himself in his room, and cried. They told him he was not good enough. Michael Jordan, only the best player, best basketball player in the world ever lived. Fired from a newspaper agency because he lacked creativity and had no original ideas. Walt Disney. Really? <laughs> Those are only three examples of people who were doubted. Here's a challenge you do not want to face at 8,000 meters. Get an asthma attack. Who here has or has ever suffered from asthma? Do you know that at 8,000 meters, the oxygen level is only 30% of what's in this room? So you can say that the simple act of breathing was a huge challenge. But that's life. It's going to throw curveballs at you. You're going to have challenges thrown at you left, right, and center. You're going to have them when you least expect them. You're going to have them when you least want them. Take the recession, for example. It's fair to say that it hit everyone bad, right? Jobs were scarce all over the world. But did you know that there were more young millionaires made in the last recession than the whole decade? Whichever goal you choose, there's one thing for sure, that you will face challenges. It is up to you to fight it and fight through it. So, here I am, on Everest, 8,000 meters above sea level. It's pitch dark, freezing cold weather. Having set a goal, five years in preparation, thousands and thousands of hours of hard work, sacrifices like you won't believe. Believing in myself and not let anyone get in my way. Overcome every challenge in front of me. And yet, I'm, I still find myself asking that single question that is still repeating in my head. Is it worth it? 20 years from now, you will find yourself in one of two places. You wake up asking yourself, what on earth happened to my life? Where did it all go? How did I lose it all? You wake up and regret having not lived, given life a good go. In short, your life is miserable. Or you can wake up proud, having lived a life with direction. You set a goal. You prepared for it. You worked hard for it. You sacrificed for it believing in yourself and did not let anyone get in your way. Overcome every obstacle in front of you. You set your version of Everest and climb it. So, is it worth it?
UCL, you've been a wonderful audience. I just want to tell you, it is worth it. Your dreams are worth it. Con los terroristas. That was the highest recorded Harlem Shake, by the way. <laughs> Shake Mohammed, that was terrific. And uh, Michael, in his opening uh, remarks, sort of asked you to inspire us. And I, I, you certainly inspired me. And uh, I'm sure everyone else. There was a chance for some questions for Shake Mohammed, if you'd like. People usually don't think of the amount of time you need before the mountain. I think uh, we're talking in the morning here. Uh, about the time behind the scenes, just for, to climb Everest. It took me five years of hard, hard training and climbing at least 10 or 12 mountains just to be able to be fit enough mentally, physically uh, for that mountain. Uh, so I think whatever you choose in life, uh, the biggest challenge will be to, to, to sacrifice the time and put in the time uh, that's, that, that is needed for you to reach that goal. Also, maybe you want to mention May 9th. May not. <laughs> yeah. So being away from loved ones, Mo's daughter was born while he was on Everest. So. <laughs> so. Yeah. Another question. I hope it's not too personal, but how old are you? Uh, 31. Okay. And uh, apparently there was a Saudi lady in your team, right? Yes. And do you know if it took her also five years of hard work to prepare for that climb? Uh, it took her how long? Three years. Three years. Three years. Okay. Sheikh, many congratulations on achieving such a momentous goal in your life. Um, I'd just be interested to know what's your next step now in life and where would you go from here? So what's the next goal? And yeah. Just like all of you here, I have a piece of paper just like this that is pinned down in my cupboard that I see every day in the morning. And it has my goals. There's an empty one, though. And it has my goals. When I wake up in the morning, I know exactly what I want. And uh, so Everest is one of my goals. And mountaineering is one of my hobbies. It's not my only hobby. So there are other things that I do. Uh, my next mountain would be uh, Denali, which is in Alaska. Uh, I also climb this, I'm climbing the Seven Summits, which is the highest mountain in each continent. I have one to go, which is Denali, Alaska. Uh, inshallah, I go in the... Uh, uh, we, we're planning to do it in uh, May. So uh, it has a very low uh, success rate. So uh, hopefully we manage to uh, climb it. A select few from the mountaineering community who have um, actually got to the top of the world. Um, what's your opinion about Mallory getting there before Hillary? What's the opinion <laughs> in the community now? The evidence is it um, accepted? I really I watched the documentary <laughs> like everyone else. I really can't say who if he did it or not, or if Hillary did. If he, if he did it, I think no one. No one would ever know. I think he knows if he did. Um, what was the scariest moment that you had on the mountain? There were some really scary bits of video there. Uh, actually, funny enough, the scariest moment was not when I got stuck, as you saw in the video. There's a, we faced an uh, avalanche, uh, not an avalanche, sorry, an, um, an ice fall that was uh, right next to me, and that was on a ladder. And there's a very good chance that the ladder will just disappear. Uh, but uh, uh, I think that was the scariest moment uh, in the whole climb. Uh, actually, Raad Zaydan was sitting here, uh, was in front of me. And I, it was the f I think 
I run it faster than Mo Farah there. <laughs> <laughs> There's a, a question at the front. And, uh... oh, I was going to say it's a really good speech. Um, I'm here with my school, and we're trying to also not do something as amazing as that, but we need, um, we're trying to be very curious to know how you uh, raise money for the uh, event. And, yeah. yeah. Well, first of all, the first time I climbed, it was not without a goal. And I felt that there was something missing. Uh, climbing for charity or for a greater cause uh, just gives you a different feeling. Uh, basically, you know that you're not climbing for yourself, not for your country, but more for all those people that will benefit from you climbing. So on the mountain, whenever I thought, and I was in doubt, or, or I thought I was too tired, and it was a lot, like you, you get sick a lot on the mountain. Just remember all those people that will benefit from you climbing that mountain. And they will just like, push you. Uh, we saw kids, in this, we, before we went to the mountain, we, we visited some schools, and we saw how poor uh, they are. And uh, we live at a privileged uh, country, the UK, Qatar, wherever we are, which means we have education, we have food, we have water. They have none. And just for, to, to be able to provide them with a good education, uh, I think is, is priceless. priceless. Another question. Congratulations on summiting Mount Everest. Sorry, I'm losing my voice. Um, I was wondering, reaching base camp, looking up to the summit or to the top, which kind of thoughts went through your head? And how many days did you have to wait to be able to climb up to the top? Uh, well, uh, base camp is about 5,360. Uh, Mr. Wood over here, tell you 365. <laughs> but uh, uh, standing there and just looking at Everest towering on top of you is, is, a, is a feeling. It's only you might think it's only 3,000 meters, but it's it's about, about a month and a half away. So it took us a month and a half from base camp all the way up to um, Everest. It's obvious that there was a team involved. I was wondering if you'd like to comment on how you chose people, um, you know, how you, how you managed to keep it all together with the team, I'm just thinking of yourself. Yes. Uh, many people climb in, in different ways. Uh, we think that the, uh, having um, us climbing as a team is our biggest plus because we, we've been climbing together for, so, for a very long time. So basically, Masoud was here. Uh, he's, we've been friends for over like 19 years now, and Rod, we've been friends for almost six years, and um, we've been climbing since the beginning together. So every mountain we did, we climbed together, and uh, just that on its own gives us so much power. And basically, um, you're away from your family, you're away from your friends, you're away from everyone for a very long time. So just knowing that you have the comfort of your friends who know basically everything about you. Because when you're on the mountain, you talk about everything. You know, like, uh, your friends on the mountain will know more about your life than anyone else. Uh, so uh, just to have that comfort, uh, we support each other and push each other. And I think if we were not together, the three of us, none of us would be standing on top of that mountain. I think that both of them would also agree with me. Uh, just supporting each other whenever we're tired, whenever we're, we're thinking, you know, I can't do it anymore. You see the other one behind you, you know, one more step, you know, you can do it. Uh, <laughs> Any other questions? I think it's the one right on the uh, back row. Hi. Hello? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, we can hear you. I'm a fellow Qatari. I'm very, very proud. Um, I'm also from the Qatar UK team, which um, uh, really makes us very proud to be here with you. And we look forward to working with you in Qatar, Brazil. Um, I think uh, my um, main question would be, what was, how did you get the idea to climb Everest? So you said you, made, you had all that preparation before Everest, and you had set that as a goal. But when did you get the first idea to yeah. start climbing? Thank you. Okay. As I said, I come from the desert. And uh, I had no idea that even that Everest existed. I knew it was the highest mountain in the world. I didn't even know in which country. Uh, so uh, being a, a traveler since I was a kid, I was in Nepal, river rafting. Uh, and we had a guide who did not stop talking for three days. 
he told us everything about Nepal, about its culture, about the politics, about everything, and then he started talking about the pride of Nepal, Everest, about uh, uh, Hillary, about attending Norway, about the Sherpas, and the, so every time he talked about the mountain, I, I grew more, uh, I have, uh, interest just grew in me, and at one point I looked at him and told his name is Medin, I told Medin, I'm climbing that mountain, and he looked at me and laughed, and he told me, you can't. <laughs> And that was a big mistake. <laughs> uh, he told me you can. And uh, mo uh, the, in the airport, I, I bought all the books about Everest, and then watched all the movies about Everest. And then, of course, all the movies, like everyone died. <laughs> so then I, I started thinking twice. But then uh, uh, a mentor of mine, uh, who was the first Arab who, who climbed the seven summits on Everest, uh, Zayd Abrafai, told me, if you really want to do Everest, the best thing to do is trek to base camp, and you will know if you want to do it or not. And the three of us trek to base camp, and on the way down we decided that's what we're going to do, and we did it. <laughs> There's another one, just uh, center back. This, uh, with this extreme weather, we saw you vomiting, uh, and uh, you, you said you had also diarrhea. Uh, I believe that would endanger your life if you have diarrhea in a very cold weather, that you frequently have to uh, switch off your clothes and... Uh, Not only that, add, add, add asthma attack with it. <laughs> uh, uh, on this clip, actually, I had an asthma attack, and I had no idea that I had asthma. Uh, I got the attack, and I thought I was just tired, and I couldn't breathe. And uh, I reached base camp, and I saw the doctors, and uh, they thought I had uh, hate, which is a pulmonary uh, edema, which means I'm off the mountain. Basically, water in the, I mean, uh, water in the lungs, and you drown from your own lungs. And being a month and a half on the mountain, imagine someone tells you, not only a month and a half on the mountain, you're a month and a half on the mountain, all this preparation, years of training, and then one point someone tells you, you have to leave because you're sick. And there's, that's it, it's gone, you have to come back the next year if you can. So it was really hard on me, but just before I, they told me, you have to leave, they gave me an inhaler and told me, try two puffs. And I took two puffs. And then they told me, oh, you have asthma. <laughs> and then, uh, and, uh, and then I, that, that's when I uh, realized that I got sports-induced asthma <laughs> at 8,000 meters. <laughs> Not the best time to find that out. <laughs> um, I think there's a question from the gentleman on the end there. Um, my question is, how do you describe the person inside you before and after reaching this goal? Sorry? How do you describe the person inside you before and after reaching this goal? I didn't get the question. Um, I mean, Are you can, you, can you please describe the person? I mean, what changed what in changed your life before okay. and after you reached this goal? Not only Everest. I got that long, long time before, long before I climbed Everest. That you appreciate every little thing in life. Uh, you appreciate water. I'm sure the mountaineers here know how. You, when you drink black water and you're happy and it's filled with hair and dust and I don't know what, and you just drink it because that's the only thing you have. And I think it's the only time I actually cried when I saw a toilet seat after <laughs> the <climate. laughs> uh, Like, you appreciate things that we take it for granted here. And I think after, you only get it after spending so much time on the mountain. And I think the thing that you really, really appreciate the most is family. When you come back from there, when you're cut off, and sometimes when you're near death, uh, what you realize how important family is and what you come back for. Congratulations, yes, Excellency. I'm from Nepal. Oh, namaste. Namaste. We are very proud. I don't know what to say, thank you. Are you planning to climb any other mountain in Nepal? How do you feel about what the people in Nepal, they are, how nice they are? How nice? <laughs> <laughs> well, well my, my life, I, I, uh, I handed my life over to, uh, to the... 
it was the question was yeah. how kind Nepalese are? Yeah, yeah, how do you feel? Because so many ethnic groups, you have so many share parts, share trees, you know, you feel that from Kashmir to do Namche. What I can say is my, my, my life was in the hands of my Sherpas. And uh, uh, my Sherpa was a Tapke, uh, Kamerita. Uh, without him, he was like my garden angel, with me the, every step, all the way up to the summit and down. And without him, I think we'd have been in uh, huge trouble. Uh, or the, our Sherpas, I think some of us won't even be here if the Sherpas won't, were not with us. Uh, my, one of my friends, uh, Masoud, suffered from uh, frostbites and five toes. Uh, uh, luckily, he managed, he, he, they were not cut off, but uh, without the Sherpas, five Sherpas were just helping him to support him walk down. Uh, at, uh, you're talking about 8,800 meters. Uh, having a rescue is impossible. If you don't walk down, they leave you there. Uh, so uh, let's say that we had a very uh, hard, <laughs> hard uh, descent from Everest, but uh, I think uh, uh, the Nepali people, uh, and especially the Sherpas, uh, have a heart that they, they sometimes put you in front of the, uh, themselves and their safety. Are you planning to do any social or charitable work? For Himalayan, this Sherpa, or two people, you say already told that. Are you planning to do some charity work for these poor people who live in the mountain area? Mm -hmm. The charity uh, reach out to Asia. Basically, uh, they're doing a scholarship fund that will uh, have uh, education purpose uh, or education projects in Nepal. So it comes from scholarships for students who graduate from school to go to university, and at the same time to also build schools all over Nepal. Thank you, Excellency. Can I offer some kada? I think you are very knowledgeable about the kada. <laughs> Without kada, it's... <laughs> Can I offer you? Yes, yes, sure. <laughs> <laughs> That seems a very nice uh, point to which to draw this part of the uh, the evening to to a close. There, there is a, a, a reception uh, just downstairs in the South Cloisters, so um, there will be a, a, a chance to, for for those of you who wish to come and. Uh, say hello in person to, uh, to Sheikh Mohammed. But before uh, we go downstairs, let me, um, on all of our behalves, uh, a huge thank you for the time that you've given to UCL today. And I should say, uh, it, it hasn't just been this wonderful lecture this evening. Sheikh Mohammed spent uh, much of the afternoon uh, working with some of our students as well. And I, I know they've uh, gained enormously from that. Um, it has been a, a true inspiration having you with us and talking about your experience of, uh, of climbing Everest. It's the first to me because the first person I've met who has actually climbed, uh, climbed Everest, so that's a, that's a personal um, thing for me. But um, on behalf of us all, thank you very much. And of course, uh, uh, from everyone at UCL, our very best wishes for your next uh, goal and uh, your, your climbing in Alaska. I hope that goes really well, but thank you very much. Thank you very much.